Welcome to Paint a Beautiful Picture. I'm so glad to have you with us for this second Saturday session. I would like to introduce you to my, this is actually my video production person, and now today she's going to sit in front of the camera with me. This is Alyssa Haney, and Alyssa, would you like to tell us just a little bit about yourself? Well, as you've heard, I'm Alyssa Haney. I'm 20 years old, and I've had the privilege of working with Miss Violet Newby for the past two months. Um, I don't know anything else super great to tell about myself, except for I have been blessed to be working with Miss Violet. So, thank, thank you. you. Alyssa. And she does have a strong nuclear family. She lives with her mom and her dad. And the rest of that story for you guys is this. She has four brothers and sisters, so she's in the middle. So she has experience with family life. Yes, yes. I do. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Ask me your first question, please. All right. So how do you deal with a child that has previously been in a pretty tough situation and now they're a part of your family and, you know, they're having trouble, you know, acting out? How do you best deal with them? Okay. That is really such a good question. As we talked about the other time, there are lots of people who can end up in your family who aren't your own, whether that's you're dealing with your grandchildren, or sometimes I've had nieces and nephews of mine who have come to live with me. Sometimes one of your kids' friends get kicked out of the house over something or another. Just you can end up with other people at your house. And certainly if you have foster children or adopted children, you understand the situation. You didn't raise them in their formative years. And oh my word, some things come up. So you have this child, he's totally out of control and he can't help it. He has had his whole life out of control. I'm going to repeat this to you. You've heard me say it already, but 80% of foster children are abused in some manner or another. That's a terrible statistic, but we can't change it. If they've been emotionally abused or psychologically abused, not necessarily severely physically abused or sexually abused, they're still going to act terribly because their whole world has been out of control. So if you bring them into a reasonably stable environment where someone loves them and cares about them, would like to give them certain kinds of guidelines or establish a certain form of discipline, I don't mean disciplining them, I mean a schedule and a routine. Uh, they don't know what that is. They've never even seen that before. That is a foreign language for them. This child is going to have a certain amount of response to suddenly trying to put the brakes on his out of control life and you trying to institute a certain amount of disciplined life. That is nothing they know. It would be like dumping you in the middle of Albania and you don't know the language and you're supposed to act normally. You're not gonna. You don't even know what normal is. Same thing with this child. So first of all, you need to really give them grace. But second of all, you've got to be extremely firm. You know, you can be firm without being mean. I do know this because I'm fully capable of it. And I've watched lots of teachers in preschool situations, especially where you just have to be extremely firm, but you don't have to be mean. So you tell them, I understand this doesn't feel good to you. I know this. Of course it doesn't. And yet, this is what we are going to do. We are going to eat vegetables in this house. Kid who's lived off of McDonald's or a bunch of other junk, and he's never eaten a pea in his life. Yeah, you can't expect that kid to love peas the first time that you feed it to him. But we're going to eat vegetables in this house. We're going to have salad in this house. You're probably going to eat differently. I want to say to you, I acknowledge this is probably a very difficult time. And I'm going to be right here. I'm going to love you. I'm going to support you. I'm taking care of you. I'm committed to you. That's what you need to be able to say that child so they can hear it. But they don't necessarily believe you because they've already heard a lot of stuff in their life. And now you got to back it up. I mean, back it up. Do what you said. This is a big thing with your own kids, but it's an even bigger thing with a foster child or an adoptive child or a child who's coming in out of a really challenging situation. I think oftentimes relatives, I've definitely seen it so many times with grandparents, they will take on a child or even a group of children, three or four of them. They really do it out of love, but they haven't thought it through. Pretty soon they're over their head. They're frantic. 
They don't even know what to do with these kids. They don't understand how they got where they are right now because, of course, they weren't there to see it all. They thought they knew their children. They had no idea what the ramifications were of some of what was going on and how it was affecting their grandchildren. So first of all, I want to say to you, it is a difficult thing, and I commend you for caring. As I have said to you so many times now, this thing of intentionality, you intend to do good things, and I believe that. Now you must follow through. You have to put feet onto your intentions. And that means you've got to get control of it. Again, an adult who's out of control, that's not going to help a kid gain control. And so you've got to have control, no matter how frustrating they are. And oh, they are going to frustrate you. <laughs> no matter how scared they are, no matter how badly they act, no matter if they break things, no matter if they yell and scream and cuss at you, you are the adult. You get control of your internally emotional state, even though you can admit that you're really angry and frustrated and upset. I don't know that I'd say that to a foster child right off the bat. They, they might not be ready for that language. But you can say it to your co-parent. You can say it in a counseling situation. You can say it to the social worker and say, I'm handling it. I'm going to handle it. Remember that language from a couple weeks ago? I chose this. I'm going to deal with this. Yes, I chose to bring these children in my home. I chose to love them. I'm choosing to give them a safe environment. I'm going to have control of myself and I'm going to maintain control of this situation. So when they're way out of control and they're going to be, and it might be as long as two or three months, this is going to take some time. Don't think in a few days or a few weeks, everything's going to be better. No, it isn't. Oh my lands. If this kid's had five or seven years of total chaos, you're not going to make this better. I'm not telling you that your love isn't going to make an impact. Mm -hmm. But you can't just make this better in a little while. And so, again, it's that matter of intention. So I intend to love this child. I intend to care for this child. I intend to do long-term what is for the best of this child. In the meantime, while it's a little bit sideways and I'm losing my mind a little bit, and the child certainly isn't doing great, I'm going to maintain control. I'm going to foster an environment that is safe and secure. And I'm going to continue to set discipline. I don't mean discipline of the child. I mean discipline of the home in an orderly fashion as a high priority until they can settle in and get adjusted. Absolutely. Great. So next question, what do you do with a child who is in need of, a, of attention constantly? Like they're always trying to get your attention and they'll get it any way they can. How do you deal with this child? I think I shared a while back that I had one son who desperately needed attention constantly. He was like the bottomless pit. And one who was pretty self-managing. and He was just fine. You know, he was kind of more independent. So when you have a child who desperately needs attention, I really want you to understand. If you don't give a child the attention they need, positive attention, affection, your time, nurturing, play, they're going to get your attention and they're going to get it negatively. <laughs> oh yeah, if a child needs attention, they're going to get it one way or the other. So if you aren't giving it to them, if they're always acting out, they're always breaking stuff, doing everything against every rule you ever had, fighting you tooth and nail about every detail of life. You know, take their food and throw it on the floor. I don't mean a two-year-old. I mean a six or an eight-year-old. They are going to do everything they can. They will rip their clothes. They just do all kinds of crazy stuff. And mm -hmm. they, it can get worse if you don't pay attention. They'll start setting fires and they'll just really do some stuff. And I know because I've oh, wow. heard and witnessed these kinds of things. Yeah. If you don't start giving that child positive attention, they are going to get your attention. If you don't give their give them the kind of attention that they need when they first start this, they are going to escalate this and escalate this. It's one of the ways, believe it or not, in which juvenile detentions are or juvenile delinquents are formed by their own parents because they're desperately crying out for attention and they do more and more and more and nobody is paying attention and they just keep escalating it. And they escalate it to the point that they're in trouble even with the law. I knew a young woman at 12 years old 
she didn't get much attention at all. And she started running around with this 19 year old drug dealer. She got arrested for throwing these big 12 inch cement blocks off the sides of bridges onto cars on the interstate. This is a true story. Okay, kids can really do some stuff. What in the world? Seriously, it's a little different than pitching a fit at bedtime or it'll get worse if somebody's not handling it. You give your kid all the attention that you can. I say that to you because sometimes it's very difficult to give them all the attention that they need. You have this desperately needy kid. Honey, you just might not have it in you. If you have four or five kids, I guarantee you that you might not have it in you. Then you need to find a way for someone else somewhere to give that child good attention. I know a lot of people in the world today, their answer to that is to take them to the social worker if they're a foster child or an adopted child or take them to counseling. I'm not telling you that that might not need to happen. That's not what I'm talking about though. I'm talking about maybe you have a sister that doesn't have any kids. Maybe you have a little old lady that lives down the street. By that, I mean maybe in her 50s. She doesn't have to be 101. Do you have this little old lady or someone at your church who's really a nice person and they'd make a great aunt? And you let this child go spend some time and receive a lot of strong attention from a healthy adult who understands what you're trying to do. You literally say to them, they need some individual attention. They need some strong, positive attention. So I'm going to share something with you that Alyssa shared with me. She has a little cousin and he's a pretty needy guy. And over Christmas, she took him with her and they went and helped someone, a friend, decorate a Christmas tree together. She said it was great, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. what did you learn from that? Well, I just learned that he really does well with a lot of attention. And since he got to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with me and my friend, he just acted amazing. I mean, he behaved and he was just having a great time. And, you know, we get home and you know, he goes right to sleep. Like, I mean, we got no trouble out of him. And it was because of that positive, you know, constant attention. Like, it just filled up his bucket. Exactly. So if you don't have it and you have a number of children and you're done, then find someone else. Get support. We've talked about that. None of us can do this all by ourselves. Get support. And in getting that support, you're getting support for the child. So you're helping to meet that child's needs. I, I want you to notice something here. I never said one single word to you about stuff, about handing them stuff, getting them bigger toys, getting them another game system. You notice I never said any of that? The reason why is a lot of people do those things to substitute and they, it looks like you're paying attention to the kid or you're giving him something he needs because he doesn't think he's going to get anything out of you personally. Maybe you can at least get this other thing. Don't go down that road for me. I, I'm begging you, basically. Give the child time and attention. That's what the child needs. And if you really notice your child looking for negative attention a great deal, you need to make an assessment. Ask yourself, am I paying enough attention to my child or this in particular child who's under my care? Because apparently this child needs attention desperately. They're looking to get it in the negative zone. Maybe I'm really not giving it to them enough in the positive areas. And what can I do to meet the needs of this child? I want to tell you one other thing that's a big deal. It isn't just kids. <laughs> it isn't just teenagers. This can also be true of young adults, or frankly, it can even be true of your mate. You see them start acting really badly. You're going, where did this come from? This may be a little ding, ding, ding going off in your mind. I'm maybe not paying enough attention to this person or investing enough of my time into this relationship. Pay attention. It isn't just kids. So talking about some of the negative ways that they are looking for attention, what are some of the ways that that works out in a negative way? Like what are some of the scenarios? Okay. We'll talk like a three to five year old kid. You'll see this kid beat up his brothers and sisters or kids in the neighborhood. He'll basically become a real bully. Because he knows that's not okay. Somebody somewhere is going to pay attention to this kind of stuff. Whether he gets into trouble or the other kid, you know, beats him up and gives him a black eye and a bloody nose. Well, suddenly somebody's going to pay attention to him. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. And 
yeah, he's getting attention. Uh, he may start really breaking things. He literally, if he has even a little build it set, I've seen him take the hammer and smash electronic stuff. This is an older one, but a DVD player. This kid tore the thing apart. Yeah, I'm talking a couple hundred wow. bucks, right? They're going to get your attention. Um, if they get a little older, they can even get more creative. They'll do things like light stuff on fire near the garage. Maybe not light up the garage yet, but get a pile of leaves and start fires. I knew a kid who started fires in his own bedroom inside of a metal pan. I I'm telling you, kids, whoa. When I said before, they're going to do things you never expected. You better get ready. You're going to be surprised. Sometimes it is not going to be a pleasant surprise. Oh, yeah, they could come up with some things. You know, a little girl, she might start really withdrawing. And so she's looking for attention for somebody to come up and go, oh, baby, what's the matter? Are you sad? Are you upset? And nobody pays any attention to her. She might do, do things. And people know that teenagers do this, but I'm talking kids will do this nowadays. Yes, we hear the train. It's a lovely sound. I've loved trains my whole life. Just so you know, we're not getting rid of that. Trains are okay. Uh, little girls, they'll cut themselves. They'll start taking scissors. Little girls? Oh, my word, girl. Yes, it can start as early as seven, eight years old. And so they'll just put a, mm. on the inside, of, moms and dads, your kids have no business seeing this. Don't help them get ideas. I mean it. This is for you. You'll see them put little cuts on the insides of their arms or little cuts on the insides of their thighs. Some people even put cuts on the in, in between their toes so that people aren't finding where the cuttings are located. But if nobody's going to pay attention to you and your insides hurt so badly, so, so badly. You're going to cut yourself because that physical pain offsets some of the internal pain. You don't see as many boys, although boys will sometimes do it. You'll see sometimes kids will yank out hunks of their hair. Yo, what happened to your hair? I pulled it out. They'll just do so many things to try to get attention. Of course, they'll do really badly in school. They'll act badly in school. Then they'll end up in timeout. They'll end up in after school detention. Sometimes they go all the way to detention. Even sometimes they go all the way to getting expelled. They want your attention and they're going to get it. That's really interesting because you don't usually think that kids that are acting like that are looking for attention. But yeah, that's what it is. Listen really carefully. Write this down in your notebook today. If you don't get anything else out of this session, whoa, I hope you get your hands on this one. When kids act the worst, they need love the most. Frankly, that's true of human beings. When people act their worst, they need your love the most. Get that one down you'll really go a long ways in being a good human being and an amazingly effective parent. I want to tell you one other way that kids will do this as teenagers. They'll do things like they'll start shoplifting. They'll start hanging out with the wrong kids and doing drugs, especially if you've run a moral uh, household with values in it. They'll go against your values. They'll go against your morals. Oh, and they'll try to make sure that you know about it. They want your attention. You got to give it to them and give that to them in a positive way. I think we've talked about that enough for you to understand what that means. But let me give you three areas in which you give them attention. One of those areas is time. As we talked about in the last Saturday session, don't tell me how much you love your child, but you have no time for them because I'll call you a liar. You must invest time. It's a big deal. It takes a long time to whoop a kid and deal with the kid and go to the court system. Why don't you invest time with them first? It's a lot smarter and significantly easier. Definitely more pleasant. Make sure that you're listening. Okay? We're all so busy. As Amanda and I talked about on the last Saturday special, we're all very busy. You've got to listen. I mean it. Sit down. Turn everything off. Do not be holding your phone in your hand. Do not be having that television set on. I mean, in that kid's space and listen. And then affection. And as we talked about, I don't care if we're talking about a teenager even, you've got to show that kid proper, appropriate, physical attention. 
which means you hug them. You put your arm around them. You put your hand on their shoulder. You pat their back. You let them know, even though you've been acting terribly, and I don't mean you have to say this out loud. You're showing them. You're demonstrating it. Even though you've been acting terribly, I'm right here. I still love you. I'm still supporting you. I care. So, Violet, can you tell me about what motivates those kinds of bad behaviors and the longing for the attention in children? Yes. There are usually two things. One is fear. I talked a while back about some kids are naturally born as worry wards or they're a little fearful. I want to tell you about something that God says because I think it's so relevant in this place. And that is that perfect love throws fear out the door. It's kind of like if you have a, a large glass jar and there's air in there, of course, and you pour in the water and all the air displaces, the water literally pushes the air right out. So this child has all this fear in his heart, this fear he'll never be long, a fear he'll never be good enough, a fear she'll never be as pretty as everyone else, a fear no one will ever love her or want her or accept her. And when you really do start pouring love into that space, fear doesn't have any choice but to get out of the way. So love gets rid of fear. When this child has all this fear, and it's sometimes innate fear. It isn't anything you did or anything that someone did. But let's be truthful. Oftentimes with a foster child, uh, a child who's been in the system who's suddenly adopted, or a child who you, I'm going to say, acquire because their parents have been struggling, whether that's with drugs or alcohol or other kinds of life difficulties, and so you've gotten the opportunity to take them in, that child's going to have a ton of fear because suddenly they don't know where they belong. The people they did know, even if they weren't nice people or good people, they're not there anymore. Now they have these strange people, maybe with really weird ideas, what they've never seen or experienced before, and suddenly they're supposed to be here. They're petrified out of their minds. And if they've been abused physically or they've been abused sexually, they got fear and they have a reason for it. That's a legitimate fear and who could blame them? That's why I said when they act the worst, they need love the most. You just got to pour love over this child, lavish love over this child. Again, love is not a bunch of stuff. That's not what love is, people. Love is you. Love is your time. Love is your energy. And love is what is best for them. Hence the schedule and the life of discipline and a certain number of guidelines. That's love, I promise you. And so you've got to give all of that love that you possibly can. And really, if you're a Christian, if you know God at all, you beg God to give you far more love than even you have yourself. So you have a deeper well of love to give away. And you just pour love out to that kid. So mm -hmm. fear is the first thing. And of course, the other thing is anger. Me, when I was a little girl, I had a brother that was a cripple and he was in a brace. And when he would come home from kindergarten, so he was like five and a half years old. No, I'm sorry. He was six when he started kindergarten. He was like six years old. So I was four. Kids would throw rocks at him and call his name, call him names and throw bricks at him or uh, mud at him. He would come home just crying with, you know, cuts on his face and dirt all over his clothes. I was furious. I was only four, but honey, I was one hot-headed little four-year-old. I started going up to the school to meet him because we lived five houses down from the school. This was in the country. It was a little ways to go there. But nonetheless, I would be in school when he would come out. And kids would start taunting him and doing stuff. I mean, I was punching those kids in the face. It was like, you are not going to act like that to my brother. I will hurt you. And I did. I was littler than them, but I was fierce. No way was I going to stand still and let someone hurt my big brother. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. My brothers and sisters that were older than me used to talk about that. You didn't want to mess with me. I would fight you. I mean, I would hurt you. And I certainly did in defense of my brother. I was angry about the way they acted. Now, that was appropriate anger. I didn't say it was appropriate for me to beat up those kids. Don't misunderstand me. But it was appropriate that I was angry in defense of my brother. You'll see kids get angry. And they, they ought to get angry. They get angry about this stupid mess. Their mom and dad are acting like 
I like to use the word morons, but in actuality, like people who are stuck in a big mess, including sometimes a mess of their own making. They just get in places they shouldn't be, and they're having a hard time getting out. And who's bearing the brunt of this? The kid. And should the kid be angry? Man, you bet. That's a, that's a raw deal, honey. There's nothing okay about that. That's not a fair story. And kids know it, and they get mad. And they're in this system, and they get drug around from house to house. I've known foster kids who have been in six houses in, like, four weeks' time. It's insane because a really tough kid to handle, they'll go into a foster situation, and three days later, the parents will be like, uh, no, you got to get this kid out of here. Uh, I can't handle this kid. Well, I, it's not that I'm being unmerciful to the foster parents because I get that too, especially if you have three or four other kids in the house and this little child's going to tear the world apart for everybody. But, oh, my word, a kid has a reason to be angry. And you know what? If a kid's been sexually molested, a boy or a girl, though boys are maybe in some ways going to express this anger more overtly, and girls are more often going to bury it and take it out on themselves. But you see this really angry little person, just furious all the time, just fighting you basically, and you're just trying to love them and take care of them, and it's all going to be a fight. Yeah, you better look at that and go, maybe this kid actually has a reason to be angry. Perhaps he doesn't know how to express it to me yet especially if he's somewhere between three and eight. Yeah, he's probably not capable yet of really expressing to you emotionally what's going on with him. But you better believe he very well may have a good reason to be angry. And so you've got to deal with those two things. You've got to deal with that fear and you've got to deal with that anger. And again, the answer is the same for both of those. And that is love, love, and more love. And so if you've got foster kids, and I'm going to tell this really straight to you, I've known people and they, they get foster kids because they get a lot of money. I'm not saying they don't care at all, but their focus is different because I hear them talk about how much cash they're getting out of this story. A, you better look at your motives. And B, you better start thinking about the child and what that child needs. If you are the person who has those children because you so desperately care, then you really make up your mind with full intention and you love them and you love them and you love them some more. I'm really glad you joined us and I want to share a couple of things with you. And the last Saturday session, I showed you a couple of my critters that I've done and I do crochet. I really love to crochet. The first time I ever made a thing called Amigurumi which is a Japanese knitted or crocheted toy, was in February of 2020. I have to tell you, I really love doing amigurumi. Okay, so these two guys are the part of the Billy Goat's Gruff series that I've been working on, and it is Wilson and Wilford Gruff. And they have a big sister. Her name is Willa Jean. She will whoop your behind. I actually wrote a rap song about her. Anyway, my grandson <laughs> thought that was so hilarious. Oh, I do have an imagination. And their biggest brother's name is Jean Willikers, but Jean is not with us today. And then Akira. She's a little Japanese-American girl up here on the shelf. And uh, Akira is made from a book called My Crochet Doll by Isabel Kasijian. And, of course, Montgomery. Montgomery is my favorite little moose. He likes to go camping in the woods. He even has a walking stick. And yeah, I, I really do have a lot of fun. So, you know, I always encourage you to be a creative person and to encourage your children's creativity as well. Alyssa, she can crochet. I can. <laughs> I sure can. <laughs> okay, Alyssa, next question. So tell me about, you know, the little quote that people say, you know, they talk about tough love and they talk about, you know, how it's good to show kids tough love. And, you know, that it's that statement just kind of confuses me because I'm like, you know, what is tough love? And is it even appropriate to show your kids? And how do you deal with your kids in like a firmly affectionate way? Because I think that's what they mean by tough love. But what does that actually mean? Oh, that is such a good question. Okay, there are a lot of implications. If you're dealing with a little, little kid, in general, I really don't believe there ever needs to be tough love. I don't. If you establish a good foundation with your child, right off the bat when they're a baby, like we've talked about, and you are talking to them, you are physically affectionate to them, 
You are keeping them in a safe environment, including an emotionally safe environment. And you are teaching and training them on a regular basis about things. I don't know any time that you would need tough love. But by the time they're in school, so somewhere between 6 and 10, and definitely when you start dealing with teenagers, okay, now it's absolutely the truth. You very well may need to do some things that require tough love. So let's talk about what tough love is and what tough love isn't. Okay. All right. So you have this teenager, because I'm going to go there first. And I think, yes, by now you will have heard about my oldest son and his little fiasco when he took off with my car. And I really did institute tough love in that situation. So you have a child who's doing drugs. And I mean, we're talking a 13 or a 14 year old kid. I don't mean an 18 year old where it gets to be a little harder to deal with. I'm talking a kid. And this kid is going out and getting high. And you know he is. He's coming home. He's all messed up. You know, you could smell the marijuana on him. You see his pupils all dilated. You know he's doing LSD or something he doesn't have any business doing. He's definitely gotten real erratic in his behavior. Hello, it is most assuredly time to put some tough love down. So tough love is when you radically get a hold of this kid and change his direction and very often against his will. And I'm going to go to another one with a girl. You have this girl and she's out shoplifting stuff all the time. She keeps bringing all these things home and you don't know where this stuff is coming. And she's like, oh, my friend got me this and my friend's mother. And you're just going, oh, yeah, okay, this is not adding up. And it's certainly not emotionally adding up, but it's adding up dollar wise to the hundreds and thousands of dollars. You're going, yeah, something's really not okay here anymore. And you got to grab that one up too and really handle this. Okay, here's tough love, what it really means and how you really do it. You say, you know what? You are going down a road is taking you nowhere but straight to hell and perdition. You are not going to get anywhere good on this road here. And you think that you're going to get away with it. But I have great news for you. I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. And I love you enough. There is no way on the face of this earth that I'm going to stand here and let you go down that road uninterrupted. It's not going to be happening here. And so guess what? You can be mad. You can hate my guts. You can whatever you want. But right here today, I'm going to be drawing the line. And this is not going to keep going. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do what it takes because I love you that much. Baby, if I got to lock you in your room, if I tell you you are not going anywhere outside of this house for the next six weeks, I mean, I will drive you behind to school and I will pick you up after school. And if necessary, I'm going to come to school and sit with you during your lunch break in the cafeteria so you're not going out and getting high in the parking lot. I mean, I am going to be your mama. I am going to be your daddy. And you are not going to keep going down this road. Mm -hmm. uh, well, honey, there's some tough love for you. And don't think your kid's going to jump up and down and go, yes, my daddy loves me. Oh, no, no, no. Because if you let them get enough steps down that road already that they're doing this kind of junk, you've been messing up. Yes, remember this one? Own your own stuff? Oh, yeah, Mom and Daddy. You better own it. I haven't been paying attention. I haven't been dealing with my child. I haven't shown them love. And they're out there begging for attention in every possible wrong way. And it's going to lead them down a really self-destructive path. <gasps> okay. Not only do I have to put the skids on my kid's life, I have to do this to my own life. Because I... I'm not going to have a blast sitting home on my kid's head for the next six weeks, listen to them yell and scream and cuss and pitch a fit and bang on their walls and break stuff. Uh, yeah, but by goodness, this isn't where my kid's going to go, and I'm the person to stop them. Uh, that's tough love. It even gets tougher. All right, so you're dealing with a young person. They're somewhere between, we'll say, 19 and 25. So they're out of high school. They should be working. They should be going to college. They should developing, be developing skills of some kind. They are a young adult. 
They need to be asserting their independence. And that's what I need to be seeing as a parent. Except my kid sits in his room or downstairs in the basement playing video games 15 or 16 hours a day. Uh, yeah, he's ordering pizza on my credit card, right? Doesn't have a job, doesn't have any interest in going to school. And he really thinks this is going to continue. Somehow in his brain, he believes this is going to continue. Or here's my daughter and she's 20 years old. She already has one baby. You know, I'm not going to raise Cain about that a lot, but I'm just stating the facts, okay? Because it happens so many times. She has one baby and uh, she's definitely still sexually active. So only God knows when she's going to end up pregnant again. And she's not really working. And she's always on the phone with her friends and she'll go, oh, hey, mom, I need you to watch the baby. And she runs off and goes out, and, you know, pluck clubbing or running around. Yeah, mom and dad, uh, you're a little overdue for some tough love time. Okay. And it's too late. Oh, no. Point. Oh, no. It is well, not too late. In some areas, it is. I mean, you still have some level, but for the most part, at that point, it's going to be a lot harder to turn your kid around. It's going to be hard to turn your kid around, but let me tell you about tough love in this situation. Okay. If your goal is to have your child become a healthy, mature, responsible adult, and they're not set in stone yet. They're still in those formative young adult years. Then it's time to intervene with some tough love. All right. This is what that means. You can send me all the emails you want. In fact, please do. Because I know this is going to bring some response out of people. You look at your son and you tell him, dude, wake up. Because... <laughs> You are not four, and I am not your mommy, and I am not your daddy, and it is not my job to take care of your sorry butt while you sit on the couch every day goofing around, but I'm still busting my behind to provide for this household. So as an adult, here are your choices. A, get a job. B, go to school. C, leave my house. The end. I kid you not. I want to tell you a story. My son, one of them, at 19 years old, was living in a different state where I had a home. And he told me every week that he was going to college. He described his classes to me. All of you know how I feel about lying, so you're going to understand this story really well. And finally, someone from church called me and they said, so Violet, did you know? And they filled in all these blanks for me. Okay, yes. You know how I reacted. And I reacted the most strongly because my kid was lying to me. And you've already heard out of me what I think about that. Whoa, I was ready to come apart. And the killer was, then this other guy called me up and said, do you know that your house has sustained some significant damage because there's been water leaking under your sink and your son hasn't dealt with it and it's like buckling your flooring in your house? True story. Okay, I didn't tell my son. I wasn't giving him one more opportunity to lie. I got in my car in Wisconsin and I i was married. So my husband and I, we drove to, to Georgia and he wasn't at the house. So we were, and he came home from wherever he was and walked in the door. Oh, and what to is wondering I should appear, but here's mama in the living room. Uh huh. Yeah, that was not a very pleasant day. I told him in no uncertain terms. I said, you've been lying your face off to me. You really thought somehow that this was all going to work out for you. You haven't been working. You're not in school. And you're destroying my property. So here's your deal. You have 24 hours 
to pack up all of your belongings and take yourself out of my house. And he did. He lived in his car for a number of weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. It probably took him a couple of years of his life to get straightened out as a young adult. I wasn't going to support him while he's lying to me, not being in any way, shape, or form responsible, etc. I had friends at the time. I can't believe how mean you were. I know you, Violet. I always knew you were hard. And I'm thinking in my mind, you don't even know all the tears I cried or how ugly this really was for me. You don't even know me at all. But great, you tell the story. I loved my son enough that in light of everything I had ever taught him, I expected him to grow up and stop acting foolishly. And I stood behind everything I ever taught him. And good for you. So my statement to you is, if you have a child and they're still in that formative stage and you're letting them get away with this junk, shame on you. Stand up. Be a man. Be a daddy. Get up. Be a mom. And say, oh, no, no, no. This isn't going to fly, my friend. You are going to do it differently. This is the hard one. And I'm going to acknowledge this to you. It is really a tough one. It's your daughter, right? You don't want to stick her out in the street, especially not with a baby. I, I totally get this. I do. I get this more than you can imagine. However, here's tough love in her case. You get in her face, preferably her daddy. I'm telling you, because she'll hear it differently from him. Girls and their mamas, they, you know, it's always like that, especially after they're about 14, 15. So it's better from a daddy. But if you don't have a daddy mom, you got no other choice than it's going to be you. And you say to her, you know what? You have a child now. And honey, it, this is not my job to be taking care of you and taking care of the baby and taking care of your life so you can still go out and party and act all irresponsible. Oh, no, no, that's going to quit. If you're going to go out clubbing on Friday night, you better have a babysitter. Because I'm not a babysitter. I have plans. Make sure you do. I mean, join a gym, join a card game. I don't care what you do. You're not home on Friday night. You can't be watching that baby because you're not even there. It's not my problem, honey. This is your child. You need a babysitter. I don't have a job. How am I supposed to do that? Well, I don't know. You got money to drink. You sure got money to pay a babysitter. Well, someone else buys my drinks. I'm sure they do. That's why you're not home till Sunday afternoon. But guess what? That's not my job. This is yours. That's tough love to a girl. Not I'm going to put you out in the street and you and the baby are going to be cold and have to deal. I didn't say that because it's a little different. But it is don't support her nonsense and let her keep getting away with the lifestyle that's just going to get her deeper and deeper and deeper in the pit. <laughs> oh, no, no. And you need a job anyway. You can work at nights because all the baby's asleep. I don't mind that. Don't think you're going to work all day and I'm going to watch the baby all day or else you're going to be paying me for child care. Because guess what? If she lived on her own, she's going to have to pay someone for child care. You have to practice tough love. And they're not going to love you for it initially. But I will tell you years later, they'll be really thankful because they'll understand it's part of what turned them around. So don't mm -hmm. go, oh, it's already too late and I can't change it. And now I'm going to have this kid sitting on my couch in the basement for the next 20 years. I'm, I'm going to end up with my daughter at 25 or 26 years old with three little babies still going out clubbing and I'm still the babysitter. No, nope. that's on you. You got to stand up and say, mm -mm. that's not going to be going on at my house anymore. I'm sorry. You're an adult and you need to be an adult. I will continue to support you and love you as an adult, but mm -mm. I'm mm -hmm. not going to financially sit here and take care of your whole world while you're acting irresponsibly. That's tough love. Mm -hmm. So in the scenario of a younger child, since you've addressed, you know, young adults and teenagers, what about those you know, six to 13 years, 13 year olds, how do you deal with tough love with that age? It's a really fascinating thing because they're learning their place in the world and they will really push it sometimes. And foster children, that's kind of like their notorious time. You're either going to take them 
down a really bad road or down a really good road. And you are the one as, a, as the parent or as the adult in the situation who has the most influence. And this is how you exert that influence. They don't have a driver's license yet. We talked about this. They don't have the capacity to go to the store. They're not able to go take themselves wherever they think they want to go. You have so much control and so much influence and you use it. You tell them point blank, you will go to school and you will come home and you will not have electronics and you will not be going outside and you will not be hanging out with your friends and you, you just take everything out of their world that they wanted. Oh, you can expect a massive get down explosion about this. Be ready. Oh yeah, because it's going to come. I've seen little girls tear stuff up about this, like put holes in their bedroom wall and tear their curtains Ooh. off the curtain rods. And Oh yeah, I've definitely seen it. And you say to them, I genuinely love you. And the way you've been acting, no, that is not going to work. That is hurting you. It is hurting our family. Don't do the whole, oh, you're breaking my heart. They don't care. They're not worried about you. Don't be playing all this manipulative stuff, thinking this is going to change their mind. That's just junk. I want you to know. It really is. And I've seen both mom and dads do this stuff to kids. Like, uh-uh. This is time to get a little bit tough. Listen to me carefully. You're going to do this. You don't have to like it. You don't even have to like me, but you're going to do it. And you exert enough influence over them till they do it. Because you still can. It's a good time to rescue them. Don't wait until they're 15 years old and they're way on down that road. And, oh my lands, they're already in the juvenile system because you didn't want to handle it. No. Grow up. I'm sorry. I'll, I'm going to put it to you really straight. Because in counseling, I don't even flinch about saying this to people. Dude, it's about time to grow some gonads. Okay? Like, I'm not joking around. Become a grown-up right here in your kid's world so that they can also grow up and become a responsible person. Get some tough love going down. That kid is going to hate your guts for a while. He might hate your guts for six months. Big deal. Grow up. Get over it. I'm not joking. So what if he hates your guts? He's going to love and respect you in the long run. For some of you who haven't been listening to me a long time, and your kid's already 8 to 10 years old and it's wild, you might actually be the perfect candidate for tough love. Again, like I've said to you before, don't go off half cocked. Don't sort of kind of, no, you really better think this over for a while. You better really assess what's going on in your kid's life and in your own. But when you decide that you are prepared to demonstrate some tough love to your kid and to really grab a hold of that situation and control it, you go for it. If you need to, you contact me. I mean, you email me every day with a question about this and the next thing, and that's absolutely okay with me. But if you have that kid who's very out of control and you're ready to tackle that, then I beg you, go ahead. Make up your mind with strong intention and get a hold of that kid. So the great news is in that age group, showing tough love is extremely effective. But if the parents already been going six or eight years in a certain particular pattern, it is going to be as challenging for them as it is going to be for the child to institute that concept and put those kind of parameters down on that kid to get him under control. As you know, I grew up in a very large family, I have nine siblings. Alyssa has four. Tell me what that's like, Alyssa. Well, um, it's been a pretty good experience overall, but, you know, along the road with five of us, and we're fairly close together, I mean like a year and a half between all of us except for the last one. And so, yeah, we um, definitely clashed in a lot of areas, and there's certainly ones that know how to push your buttons more than others, but... Overall, it's been a really good experience, and I wouldn't, I don't know how only childs do it. Gotcha. I really like having siblings. And you say how some of them can push your buttons, right? And they know you so well, it like takes seconds, and they can already go there with you emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Don't we know this? It's a party. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do know about this. Okay. Here's a really great thing. I told this to my kids 
all throughout their lives. And oh my goodness, what do you know? I was right. If you ever get to say, my mama was right. Yeah, this is something for sure. My kids say this about it all the time. God is so wise. He places us in families. That means that he knows the people who are your brothers and sisters. And he actually has a plan about that. I always said to the boys, you better learn really well how to get along with your brother, how to handle your brother's irritating parts, and how to communicate with your brother, because my sons are such polar opposites, because someday you're probably going to grow up and marry someone who's a lot like your brother. And they laughed at me about that. Or you're going to grow up and be best friends with or work alongside of or start a business with someone with elements and characteristics that your brothers and sisters have. So your family is that learning space, how to socialize, how to communicate, how to problem solve how to develop meaningful relationships with people who are not just like you, but whom you care about and respect. My son grew up and married someone an awful lot like his brother. <laughs> well, he married yes. a woman, right? <laughs> yeah, she's a woman. But all I'm saying to you is personality-wise, oh, just what I told him. Yes, just exactly. It's a fact. God gave you those people within your family, maybe even your mom and your dad, truthfully, in order that you can learn and develop and grow in, in your skills and in your people skills. So those very people that irritate you and drive you wild and can push your buttons, when you learn how to respond to them with patience, with grace, when you learn how to confront issues correctly and when you learn how to extend forgiveness and you find out what repentance really looks like in that kind of an intimate setting of a family, it equips you for the rest of your life in the kinds of ways that you have to relate to other people. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> so thank God for your family because that was his plan, those very people. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you are developing things in your children, in their relationships together, that are going to allow them in the future to have healthy and strong relationships with other people, whether in business, at school, or even in their marital relationships. It's a lot of fun to do that as a parent when you look at the differences between them and help them to develop an appreciation for their differences. So often in my original family, everyone wants everyone else to conform. And then if you're not just like me, you're wrong. What a tragedy. I've been around this globe. I've lived in multiple cultures and people all over the world are nothing like me. And I can appreciate the differences. They don't have to be just like me. I don't have to be just like them, and yet their culture and their ideas are really beautiful. Foster that in the way that your kids relate to each other. It's a good thing. I want to thank you once again for joining us today on a Saturday special with Paint a Beautiful Picture. And I really hope that you have an amazing day with your children today. You may find additional information on our paintabeautifulpicture.com website. Additionally, you may watch me on Rumble, and you may also listen to a podcast on Buzzsprout or Spreaker, all under the name Paint a Beautiful Picture. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. You may subscribe, and if you are interested in receiving notifications, please hit the notifications button.